Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Immunogen's fourth quarter and full year 2021 Financial and Operating Results Conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the call over to Courtney Okanik, Senior Director of Corporate Communications. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thank you for joining today's call. Earlier today, we issued a press release that includes a summary of our recent progress and fourth quarter and full year 2021 financial results. This press release and a recording of this call can be found under the Investors and Media section of our website at AmeetEngine.com. With me today are Mark Ennedy, our President and CEO, Anna Birkenblit, our Chief Medical Officer, and Susan Altshuler, our CFO. Kristen Harrington-Smith, our Chief Commercial Officer, will also join us for Q&A. During today's call, we'll review recent accomplishments for the business, our financial results, and highlight upcoming anticipated events. We will use forward-looking statements with respect to our business strategy, the development and benefit of our product candidates, the design of our clinical trials, the presentation of clinical trial data for our product candidates, the anticipated timing of clinical trials and regulatory submissions to the FDA for certain product candidates, the anticipated commercial launch for certain product candidates, financial guidance, and our cash runway. Each forward-looking statement is subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause our actual results to differ materially from such statements. These risks and uncertainties include those described in our press release issue this morning and in the risk factor section of our most recent annual report on Form 10-K and our other SEC filings, which are available at sec.gov and on our website at immuneengine.com. This forward-looking statement in this presentation speak only as of the original date of this call, and we undertake no obligation to update or revise any of these statements. With that, I'll turn the call over to Mark. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. 2021 was a productive year for Immunogen, with significant progress across the business as we move towards our objective of becoming a fully integrated oncology company. In particular, we delivered resoundingly positive results in Soraya our pivotal study for mervatuximab and ovarian cancer, generated compelling data with IMGN 632 and AML, advanced our earlier stage programs, established a plan to reignite our research engine, laid the groundwork to support our first commercial launch, and executed the single largest financing in the history of the company. With this progress, we've generated significant momentum in the business as we enter 2022. To expand on these points, starting with our lead program, Mervatuximab, Soroftanzine, and Ovarian Cancer, our top priority this year is to gain accelerated approval for Mervatuximab as a monotherapy in patients with folate receptor alpha-positive platinum-resistant disease. To this end, we believe the positive top-line Soraya data reported in late November position us for initial approval in this setting with significant unmet need. We're on track to submit the BLA for Mervatuximab by the end of this quarter, and are preparing for potential accelerated approval and launch in the second half of the year. We also expect to generate data from our confirmatory Mirasol trial in the third quarter, which is intended to support full approval. As part of our comprehensive strategy to move Mervatuximab into broader patient populations and become the combination agent of choice in ovarian cancer, we've designed a number of additional company-sponsored studies and, in parallel, are supporting investigator-sponsored trials for Mervatuximab which Anna will discuss in further detail shortly in the call. In step with advancing the Mervatuximab program towards regulatory approval, we began building our commercial and medical affairs organizations, now led by our Chief Commercial Officer, Kristen Harrington-Smith, and our Head of Medical Affairs, Dr. Mimi Huizenga. Launch preparations for Mervatuximab are well underway and are focused on four key priorities redefining expectations for positive outcomes with mervatuximab and platinum-resistant ovarian cancer, supporting adoption of early folate receptor alpha testing and establishing standards for in-house and centralized testing, ensuring positive physician and patient experiences through tailored education and guidance for patient management, and seeking broad payer access and reimbursement and delivering a seamless patient experience. We're off to a strong start building best-in-class sales, marketing, and medical education teams and have most recently added our head of sales. Our second program, Pavecumab Sineering, formerly known as IMGN 632, is progressing nicely. We've advanced our pivotal cadenza study in BPDCN and expect top-line data in the frontline cohort in the second half of this year. 
In addition to BPDCN, we were pleased to present data from the triplet regimen evaluating PVEC in combination with azacitidine and venetoclax in relapsed refractory AML during an oral session at ASH and are encouraged by the safety profile and efficacy observed, particularly in the higher intensity cohorts. Based on these data, we've initiated an expansion cohort for the triplet and relapse patients and expect to move into frontline patients during the year. Regarding our earlier stage portfolio, dose escalation continues in the phase one trial of IMGC 936, our first in class ADAM9 targeting ADC, which we are co-developing with macrogenics and multiple solid tumor types and anticipate sharing data from this program later this year. We also submitted the IND for IMGN 151, our next generation antifolate receptor alpha ADC. Due to a delay in drug product production at our vendor, FDA placed a hold on our IND application pending responses to some CMC-related information requests. We are generating the data responsive to these requests and look forward to enrolling our first patient following submission of this information to the agency. Turning to business development, we were pleased to announce a multi-target global licensing deal with Eli Lilly earlier this month. This deal demonstrates the strength of our technology and leadership in ADCs and generates value from our intellectual property around our proprietary campus and platform. Lastly, we completed an upsized follow-on offering that generated roughly $295 million in gross proceeds in the fourth quarter, and we ended the year with over $475 million in cash. These funds, together with product and collaboration revenues, will support the business through the initial launch of Mervituximab and other material inflection points and into 2024. With that, I'll turn the call over to Anna to provide some additional color on our clinical programs. Anna? Thanks, Mark. We are extremely pleased by the positive top-line results for our pivotal Soraya trial. Recall that despite advances in the frontline and platinum-sensitive settings, most patients with ovarian cancer eventually relapse with platinum-resistant disease. Treatment options for platinum-resistant ovarian cancer are limited consisting primarily of single-agent chemotherapy, which has limited activity with objective response rates ranging from 4 to 13 percent and considerable toxicities. Having aligned with FDA on the substantial unmet need in this population, Soraya was designed as a single-arm study of mervituximab in patients with platinum-resistant ovarian cancer whose tumors express high levels of folate receptor alpha and who have been treated with one to three prior lines of therapy, including prior bevacizumab. The primary endpoint of confirmed objective response rate, or ORR, as assessed by investigator, was 32.4%, well over double the expected response with single-agent chemotherapy. Five of the responses were complete responses, which doesn't happen very often with available therapy in platinum-resistant disease. Median duration of response, or DOR, is a key secondary endpoint and was 5.9 months as of the data cutoff on November 16, 2021. With nearly half of the responders still receiving mervituximab at that time, the duration of response continues to evolve. These results are particularly encouraging in light of the heavily pretreated population in which 51% of patients have three prior lines of therapy. All patients received prior bevacizumab, and 48% had received a prior PARP inhibitor. Turning to safety, the profile in Soraya is consistent with the known safety of mervituximab, which has now been studied in over 800 patients. The most common adverse events were low-grade, reversible, ocular, and GI events, managed with supportive care and dose modifications if needed. The tolerability of mervituximab is demonstrated by the low 7% discontinuation rate for treatment-related adverse events, including just one patient in Soraya discontinuing for an ocular adverse event. No corneal ulcers or perforation have been reported. As in prior studies, the ocular events were predictable, manageable, and reversible. Looking ahead, Dr. Ursula Mavalonis will present the full Soraya data set at SGO during the plenary late-breaking abstract session on Saturday, March 19th. Data will include updated duration of response and key subgroup analyses, including patients with three prior lines of therapy and those who received a prior PARP inhibitor. Progression-free survival data will also be presented. 
As mentioned, we are on track to submit the BLA for Mervituximab before the end of the first quarter in support of potential accelerated approval later this year. In support of full approval, the confirmatory Mirasol study of Mervituximab is expected to read out in the third quarter of 2022. We also continue to enroll patients in Piccolo, a single-arm study of Mervituximab monotherapy in approximately 75 patients with folate receptor alpha-high recurrent platinum-sensitive ovarian cancer intended to support label expansion. Piccolo is designed to address the increasing unmet need for an effective, non-platinum option in later lines of platinum-sensitive disease. With an overall response rate of 64%, our Phase I data show a potential for mervituximab in this patient population. We have formalized our strategy to position mervituximab as the combination agent of choice, with compelling data from the mervituximab plus bevacizumab doublet in patients with folate receptor alpha-high recurrent ovarian cancer we expect to gain compendial listing for this combination in close proximity to the initial monotherapy approval of mervituximab. These data also support our design of Gloriosa, a potential label-enabling phase three study in the second-line platinum-sensitive maintenance setting. About a third of second-line platinum-sensitive patients receive a platinum doublet plus bevacizumab followed by bevacizumab maintenance. The addition of bevacizumab to a platinum doublet provides an overall modest improvement in PFS of approximately three to four months in this setting, highlighting the limitations of available therapy. Gloriosa is designed to evaluate the PFS benefit of mervituximab plus bevacizumab maintenance versus bevacizumab maintenance alone in all patients who have not progressed following completion of their platinum doublet plus bevacizumab. Approximately 440 patients will be randomized to either mervituximab plus bevacizumab or bevacizumab alone for maintenance. The primary endpoint is progression-free survival. Secondary endpoints include overall survival and overall response rate. We anticipate initiating Gloriosa in the second quarter of this year. Given the promising activity we've seen with the mervituximab plus carboplatin doublet in phase one dose escalation in recurrent platinum sensitive disease across a range of folate receptor alpha expression with an ORR of 80% and median duration of response of 24 months in FR alpha medium and high patients, we recently announced the planned initiation of trial 420. Trial 420 is a single arm phase two study of mervituximab plus carboplatin followed by mervituximab continuation in approximately 110 patients with folate receptor alpha low, medium, or high platinum-sensitive ovarian cancer. The data from this study will inform our path to registration in this setting. Moving to pivecamab sunarine, our CD123 targeting ADC. We presented initial safety and efficacy findings from the phase 1-2 study of pivecamab in combination with azacitidine and venetoclax in patients with relapsed refractory AML in an oral session at ASH in December. Demonstrating an ORR of 48% in all relapsed refractory AML patients, these data are encouraging, particularly in higher intensity cohorts where we observed higher response rates, including an ORR of 59% and a 38% composite complete remission rate. Importantly, the pivecamab triplet demonstrated no tumor lysis syndrome, venoocclusive disease, capillary leak, or cytokine release. These data reinforce the potential of pivecamab as a new combination therapy for AML, which unfortunately is characterized by poor outcomes despite available therapies. We have opened an expansion cohort in relapsed AML patients and plan to initiate a frontline expansion cohort later this year. Also at ASH, we presented pivecamab monotherapy data featuring vignettes from three frontline BPDCM patients in a poster session. All three patients achieved clinical complete remission, and pivecamab was associated with limited grade three or greater treatment-related adverse events and no capillary leak syndrome. We continue to enroll patients in the U.S. and Europe in Cadenza, our pivotal phase two study in frontline and relapsed refractory BPDCM, anticipate top-line data during the second half of 2022, and believe pivecamab has the potential to become a best-in-class monotherapy treatment option for BPDCM patients. With that, I'll turn the call over to Susan to cover the financials. Susan? 
Thanks, Anna. Starting with our results for the full year 2021, we generated $69.9 million in revenue, $46.8 million of which came from non-cash royalty revenues. The remainder came from license and milestone fees, which include recognition of $14.6 million of the $40 million upfront fee previously received under the company's collaboration agreement with Huadong Medicine, and $7.4 million of revenue from partner milestones. Operating expenses were $194.9 million, comprised of $151.1 million of R&D expenses, compared with $114.6 million in 2020, and $43.8 million of G&A expenses, compared with $38.6 million in 2020. We ended 2021 with $478.8 million in cash on the balance sheet. Turning to our financial guidance for 2022. We expect revenues to be between $75 and $85 million, operating expenses between $285 and $295 million, and cash and cash equivalents at year end between $245 and $255 million. Given the range and timing for potential approval of Mervituximab, revenue guidance does not yet include potential product sales from Mervituximab. We expect that our current cash, combined with the anticipated product and collaboration revenues, will fund operations comfortably into 2024. With that, I will turn the call over to Mark for closing comments. Thanks, Susan. We entered this year with a motivated and strong team and exciting prospects for the business. Between now and the end of the year, we expect to launch our first product, report pivotal data for PVEC, advance our early stage programs, and further build our pipeline and research capabilities. We have the right strategy, leadership, and resources in place to generate significant value in the near and long term, and I look forward to more good days for our people, our business, and our patients. With that, we'll open the call for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question at this time, you will need to press the star then the one key on your touchdown telephone. To withdraw your question, you may press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Now, first question coming from the line of John Newman of Canaccord. Your line is now open. Hi, guys. Good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Congrats on the continued progress. Um, so two quick questions. First one is, for the progression-free survival data from Sarea at SGO, just curious if we'll see both investigator assessed and independently assessed. And then on Pivecamab or 632, just curious, as to what patient population and potential combinations you're considering um, for a future pivotal study. Thanks. Anna? Hi, John. Yeah, so at SGO, we will have the full data set from Sarea, which will include um, overall response rate, duration of response, subsets, and we will include PFS data as well. Um, I would encourage folks to come uh, to SGO to uh, uh, assess the PFS data, and we will have um, an investor event shortly thereafter. Uh, moving on to uh, the PVEC question, uh, in terms of future pivotal trials, we are thinking about the triplet uh, pivecamab plus azacitidine plus uh, venetoclax in relapsed refractory AML. Uh, based on the data that we uh, have already generated in phase one dose escalation and now we're exploring in an expansion cohort that potentially could support a single arm study uh, in the relapsed uh, setting. In addition, we plan to explore uh, a frontline setting for this triplet and should those data look promising, then we could consider a frontline uh, randomized phase three trial uh, to support approval for that triplet in the frontline setting. Great, thank you. Now, our next question coming from the line of Michael Schmidt from Guggenheim Securities. Helen is open. Hi, good morning. This is Ige Al for Michael. Congrats on the progress and thanks for taking our questions. Uh, two quick questions from us. Number one, for Miroso, um, Anna, could you please um, uh, uh, help us understand the, the mix of the patients with and without prior deficit map? How are the two groups different in baseline characteristics, and how might the, uh, that impact the response to MERV? 
And the second question: Can you talk about your Capital Capital Thousand ADC platform that you license to Vili?、Uh, how is the payload different from other、uh, Type One、uh, topoisomerase targeted ADC? Thank you. Anna. Yeah. So for Mirasol,、uh, the patient population will include both、uh, patients with and without prior bevacizumab. Uh, similar to Forward One, the prior Phase Three study, where we had a mixture of patients,、uh, in Forward One about half of the patients had prior bevacizumab and half did not. We anticipate a similar patient mix in Mirasol. And when you think about which patients get bevacizumab, they tend to be、uh, patients、uh, with worse prognosis and are more heavily pretreated.、Uh, let me start with the worst prognosis and then move to heavily pretreated. Um, bevacizumab、uh, is approved in several settings for ovarian cancer. The only one of which that has demonstrated an overall survival advantage is in、uh, the first-line setting for poor risk patients. These are patients with stage four disease, suboptimally debulked, ascites, etc. So、uh, many physicians often reserve bevacizumab for those worst patients, particularly、uh, in Europe. Uh, and we can see that actually、uh, in the Sorea study when you come to SGO in terms of、uh, the demographics of the patients enrolled in terms of、uh, their their stage of disease. Moving to number of prior lines of therapy, also、uh, bevacizumab. It, it's it's hard for us、uh, in prior studies to tease apart、uh, bevacizumab versus number of prior therapies. And you know, as as a point of reference to support that, in the Forward One study, 65% of patients had one to two prior lines of therapy, and 35% had three priors. You may recall that in Sorea, 51% of patients had three prior lines of therapy. So the Sorea population、uh, is more heavily pre. Treated and potentially a worse population than what we anticipate seeing in the Mirasol study, based on the prior Forward One study.、Uh, moving to the next question on camptothecins. So、uh, our camptothecin payloads are、uh, specifically designed、uh, to address anti-tumor potent anti-tumor activity uh, and uh, have. Basically, unique uh, uh, properties from a chemical perspective that give、uh, broad IP coverage、uh, for us. I think that's that's what I can say at this point. I don't know, Mark,、uh, if you want to add any color to the camptothecin payloads. Yeah, maybe just a little broader、um, observation here. So, you know, we take some pride in having multiple、uh, classes of payloads to apply to ADC. So, you know, we've got. At least three generations of metanzines.、Um, we have our indolino benzodiazepine DNA acting payloads, and we were looking for additional classes. And our team, you know, engineered、um, this, you know, this new version of the camptothecins with the goal of broadening the therapeutic index versus what we see、um, with、uh, some of the other camptothecins that.、Um, Have been deployed in the ADC context, and we've got very good、uh, preclinical data、uh, supporting that we've been able to, you know, drive activity at least、uh, in that range、uh, with better tolerability. So we're excited about that. Lily was excited about that, and、uh, are moving forward、um, with the tech transfer for them、uh, for their uh, targets, uh, while at the same time advancing、uh, internal programs that will deploy that payload. Thank you very much. And our next question coming from the line of Ed Sutter with BMO Capital Markets, Elena Sulpin. Great,、uh, thanks for taking the question.、Um, the first one for me,、um, you know, with respect to PFS and Sarai, I guess, how, how meaningful is this update from your perspective in this late line, post bev, you know, setting, and will we see benchmarks? For this specific population、um, at SGO, and then secondly on IMGM 151, given sort of the CMC、um, submission update, are, are are you still on pace to start the phase one in the first half of this year? Thank you. Yeah. So, 
Yep, I'll take the PFS question and then uh, yep. we can. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Mark, for the 151 question. So, regarding Soraya, uh, you're absolutely right. The population is a late line post BEV setting, and frankly, um, this is one of the most heavily pretreated populations that has been studied in platinum resistant ovarian cancer in a study this size. So, there are no good benchmarks. Uh, but what I can tell you is there are multiple studies that have been published showing in ovarian cancer, as in other solid tumors, uh, uh, the law of diminishing returns, if you will. Uh, with each line of therapy, the expectations for uh, per, uh, response rate, duration of response, and progression-free survival diminishes. So when you get to these really later line patients, physicians' expectations regarding uh, efficacy are, are quite low given their experience. And, Certainly, you know, the data that we've shared with the investigators uh, on the Soraya study, they're quite pleased uh, with the totality of the efficacy data that we have shared with them in terms of ORR, uh, duration of response, and PFS, because, as I said, the expectations that they have for these patients, later line post bev setting is quite low. Um, what I will tell you uh, is that um, we will share data at SGO uh, to put the PFS data from Soraya into context based on what we've known from prior studies uh, uh, of mervituximab. Uh, as, as you've seen, we've replicated the overall response rate data um, in Soraya that uh, we had previously uh, gathered in that 70 patients of foundational data that basically created the hypothesis that we have tested in Soraya and now confirmed. So, again, we'll have the data uh, and put it into context for you at SGO. Mark, over to you for 151. Great. Yeah, thanks. So, just to reiterate the point that uh, we made in the introductory uh, comments, um, this is a CMC and not a, a clinical issue. So. You know, in order to issue a study may proceed letter for an IND, the FDA requires the sponsor to submit CMC data relating to the drug, including drug product stability. Most often, those data are included in the IND submission. Um, and in some cases, the sponsor will make the data available to the agency during the review period. In the case of 151, we plan to submit um, the required data during the review period. However, due to delays at our drug substance vendor, uh, we were not able to secure a drug product pr production slot as we had planned, which meant that we weren't in a position uh, to update the I and D uh, during the uh, during the review period. So the agency put us on hold. We've now secured our, our drug product slot for this quarter, and we will generate uh, the required data. Uh, and expect to come off clinical hold in uh, due course. Um, it's too early to give updated guidance uh, in terms of we will be delayed, um, but it's too early to give updated guidance on the timeline for uh, first patient uh, in, but we will update you when we've got a better sense uh, following the DP run. Got it. Thank you. Um, congrats on all the progress. Thank you. And our next question coming from the lineup for a speaker with Colin. Your line is open. Great. Thanks. Uh, maybe uh, looking forward to the SGO, I think a lot of investors are going to be focused, obviously, on the PFS results and use that as a basis to estimate the probability of success of Mirasol. So maybe you could help us try to uh, understand how we should be thinking of translating the PFS from Soraya to Mirasol quantitatively. Thanks, Boris. Um, you know, I think we have actually much better data to guide uh, PFS from forward one uh, to uh, Mirasol. What I mean by that is that PFS in a single-arm study uh, like Soraya is really not interpretable. You don't have a control arm to tease apart the anti-tumor activity uh, from the underlying uh, tempo of disease. And so that's why FDA does not use uh, PFS uh, when they are looking at uh, anti-tumor activity to support accelerated approval. It's about ORR and DOR. If people want to assess uh, the probability of technical success for Mirasol, I would encourage them to review the data that we've already generated in Forward 1. Recall that Forward 1 was the randomized Phase 3 study of mervituximab versus investigator choice chemotherapy. And in the FR alpha high subset identified by the PS2 scoring method, that is the population that we're basically replicating in Mirasol. And in Forward 1, we demonstrated a median PFS 
in that population of 5.6 months. The hazard ratio in forward one, based on either investigator or independent, uh, blinded independent was review, was around uh, 0.6. And you may recall that in Mirasol, we designed the study to target a hazard ratio of 0.7, much more conservatively. So we've already run the experiment in forward one. The population in Mirasol will be essentially the same in terms of platinum resistance, one to three priors, FR alpha high, about half of them having prior bevacizumab. The one difference is that we'll have a higher percentage of patients with PARP inhibitors now. And we've already demonstrated in Soraya, and you'll see the full data uh, at FGO, that mervatuximab has very nice activity regardless of uh, prior PARP use or not. So from our perspective, the Soraya data increased the probability of technical success for Marisol because we now have that, that answer about what about prior PARP inhibitors. Thanks, Boris. Got it. And my <coughs> second question is on the Cadenza study and BPDCN. Could you set expectation what you need to show in the study for approval? Yeah, so the uh, statistical design for Cadenza is really uh, uh, allowing us to enroll a cohort of up to 20 patients uh, in this ultra-rare indication. There's somewhere between 500 and 1,000 new patients a year in the U.S. and similarly in Europe. Uh, and so looking at uh, the efficacy data for the one approved agent uh, in in uh, BPDCN, we know that uh, the CR slash CRC rate is uh, in the 40 to 50 percent range. And so uh, we would need to demonstrate uh, a CR CRC rate uh, in that range uh, with uh, nice efficacy. And from a statistical perspective, that based on the sample size that we're using, that uh, rules out this 10 percent uh, CRC rate that FDA guided us to. Got it. Thank you for taking my question. Sure. <coughs> Our next question coming from Delana of Andesu with William Blair. Yolanda Sulpin. Great. Thanks for uh, taking my questions, and uh, congratulations on all the uh, progress last year. Um, so first question has to do with the, uh, all the, uh, the new trials. Um, so, so, Anna, I'm just curious if you have um, you know, had it decided on the trial design for gloriosa, gloriosa in terms of the treatment duration um, in the maintenance phase. And also, maybe a step back, um, can you use this trial as a confirmatory study for Piccolo? Um, I know that sometimes, you know, FDA allows you to confirm using kind of a different uh, patient population. Um, and the second question is for Kristen. I'm, I'm just curious. As you prepare to launch MERV, um, have you decided on how the drug will be distributed? Um, so specifically, I'm, I'm curious about the ordering and delivery system. Um, is that mostly on demand? Um, and if that's the case, how should we think about the gross to net? Thank you. Sure. So we're really excited about the Gloriosa study, which is a study of adding mervituximab to maintenance bevacizumab versus maintenance bevacizumab in the recurrent platinum-sensitive setting. Why are we excited about this? Because we've already generated beautiful data in the treatment setting for the MERV-BEV doublet, uh, showing response rates of 59% uh, in platinum-resistant disease, 69% in uh, platinum-sensitive disease that are, you know, above the benchmarks. And so we want to move that active, to well-tolerated doublet into the maintenance setting. We know that patients, once they have recurrent platinum-sensitive disease, more and more of them will have already had a PARP inhibitor in the frontline setting, and so using a triplet uh, in the recurrent platinum sensitive setting makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, so with that, we will take all patients uh, who have completed their triplet uh, in terms of the, the carboplatin doublet portion of it, and as long as they haven't progressed, so they have a CR, a PR, or stable disease, they will be randomized to MERV-BEV versus BEV alone. And you may recall that in this setting, that entire treatment path for bevacizumab only, bev only adds about three to four months of progression-free survival. Uh, so adding mervituximab, you know, a non-cross-resistant targeted cytotoxic, we anticipate that we will have 
responses on the MERV BEV arm, and there will be a long treatment duration on the MERV BEV arm, really benefiting patients. The primary endpoint is progression-free survival. The study is also has sufficient power for us to demonstrate an overall survival uh, advantage, and that could really transform the, uh, the treatment paradigm for these patients. Uh, regarding your question about confirming whether or not Gloriosa could uh, stand in as a confirmatory trial for Piccolo, it's a little too soon for us to work that through. Um, you know, Piccolo is enrolling now, um, and we need to engage with FDA on uh, uh, the exact criteria for a, a path toward accelerated approval. So I would stay tuned for that. And let me turn it over to Kristen now. Thanks, Anna. So um, to respond to your question, we, we do plan on using a 3PL, so like you said, a on-demand or drop-ship model. And um, this is to help us with our growth to net, but at this time, um, that's, all, that's all we would like to comment on growth to net. Does that help? Um, yeah, okay. Um, so I guess the, the question is really, you know, how how would the kind of course net differ from um, from other you know other drugs or more traditional distribution? So that's kind of where I am curious about. Yeah. So our our goal is to avoid many of the wholesaler fees. Okay, that's a. And is that okay, I mean, yeah, no, no. So I mean. When you look at the, the patient numbers and volumes here, there's no need to have, you know, a, a massive amount of inventory sitting at uh, wholesalers, you know, awaiting to be distributed. So it's much more efficient from our perspective. And most of the ADCs use this model of, you know, setting up a 3PL um, and then having the, you know, the orders come in and, and fulfilling those using the dropship model. And in doing that and setting up a very streamlined approach here, we're avoiding a lot of the fees that are attendant to having inventory sitting at a at a wholesaler. We can't right. tell you right now. We we can't tell you right now what exactly the gross to net would be, and that that probably wouldn't be a good idea in the first instance. Right. Okay. That's that's really helpful. Thank you so much. So 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 yeah. Anna, I, I I'm, I'm curious. The, the so the is there like a fixed duration for the maintenance phase for um, for Gloriosa? Is there like one year, you know, 18 months or two years? I'm just curious if that's been um, set. Yeah, so in the frontline setting, when you do maintenance trials, there is a fixed duration because there's a chance that some of your patients are going to be cured. Um, once you have recurrent platinum sensitive disease, the expectation is that you're not cured. So patients will be treated uh, until progression and intolerable toxicity, or, you know, intolerable toxicity. But I have to say, I mean, across the MERV program, we've had patients on Mervituximab for one year, two years, three years, even up to four years, um, and still going. So, uh, you know, in terms of the tolerability of Mervituximab as a monotherapy, we know uh, that it's quite well tolerated. And with the MERV-BEV, uh, we've had patients on that uh, doublet for a good long time as well, um, both in the platinum-resistant and the platinum-sensitive setting. So, you know, I, I can't tell you an estimated uh, duration in maintenance uh, in the recurrent platinum-sensitive setting, but it's going to be long because we're, you know, we're, we're, we know that the PFS of these patients is going to be uh, quite long. Great. Thank you so much for answering all my questions. Thanks, Andy. Our next question coming from the line of Kelly Shi with Jeffrey Silani Selpin. Good morning. This is how I'm calling in for Kelly Shi. Um, first, thanks. Um, first, congratulations on the great quarter. So my question is really um, for the Mirasol trial. Given the assumption for the medium PFS, the chemo arm is about 3.5 months. Um, do you see any risk that the control arm might outperform, given that more option of uh, chemo therapy is available for the control arm. And then my second is regarding to the ECOG01 performance status. Do you see that may also uh, influence the patient outcome in the control and treatment, treatment arm, and how the patient, in terms of the consistent weight of the 01 status, um, if it's consistent from the forward one trial to Soraya and the uh, uh, you know, Mirasol trials? Okay. So 
Your question about the progression-free survival estimate on the control arm of Mirasol. We have designed it for 3.5 months because that's pretty much what every study in platinum-resistant ovarian cancer has shown. Um, I would remind you that in forward one for the FR alpha high subset, we actually had a median PFS of 3.2 months. Um, you know, there are some studies out there suggesting that FR alpha is a poor prognostic factor, so it may be with single agent chemotherapies, um, patients with high FR alpha do worse than the overall population. So, if anything, I think the control arm on Mirasol might underperform, not outperform. I didn't understand your comment about it might outperform because more options are available. Um, the options on the Mirasol control arm are Topotecan, Paclitaxel, and Doxel, just like they were in the Forward 1 study. These are all drugs that have been approved and, uh, you know, it, it, 20 years ago. Um, so it's not like now there's more better, better therapies. Unfortunately, we're using the same old single-agent chemotherapies that have been around for a couple of decades. So um, if anything, I think the control arm on Mirasol might underperform, but we certainly didn't design it assuming that it needed to, you know, for, for success of the study. Moving to ECOG performance status, zero or one. Um, you know, the ECOG performance status of zero means people feel perfectly well. Uh, ECOG status of one means they're a little tired. Um, and the lower the performance status, certainly the worse patients do. Um, and that's why we've excluded patients with poor performance status, two, three, or four, uh, because that's when you, you know that the, the, the risks of um, the, whatever you're uh, studying begin to potentially outweigh the benefits because the patients just aren't fit enough. Um, so given the population that we've enrolled across the Mervituximab program, ECOG status is zero or one. We typically have a similar distribution across all the studies, and we do not anticipate any difference from an efficacy or a tolerability perspective for either subset of patients. Great. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Our, our next question coming from the line of Kenan McKay with RBC Capital. Yolanda Sulpin. Hey, good morning, and thanks for taking the question. Um, just one on um, the, the Soraya filing plan. Is the data from Soraya sufficient for the Ventana uh, full R1 companion diagnostic and, and accelerated approval uh, of the diagnostic as well? Or um, is there additional data from, from Mirasol or other trials in the future that, that's also needed or, or, again, just in a confirmatory sense? Um, and then on, on the Morova trial, can you maybe talk about the rationale um, for that trial and that carboplatin plus MERV uh, doublet and, and potentially what the next steps there could be? Thanks. Sure. I'll take the uh, CDX question, and then, um, Anna, you can talk about the um, IST with Harder. So um, the answer is yes. The data from Soraya are sufficient to support the approval of the um, of the of the companion diagnostic. I think as we've discussed previously on these calls, we're working with Ventana, which is uh, Roche Tissue Diagnostics. They've actually submitted the the PMA is in four modules. They've already submitted the first module. Uh, they have our clinical data, which is being integrated into the subsequent modules, and they will file. Uh, in close proximity to our BLA uh, submission, uh, which would put them on track to have the CDX approved uh, at the same time as uh, as the drug. And for the Mirova study, this is a randomized phase two investigator-sponsored trial in Germany led by Dr. Philip Harder. Uh, it's approximately 140 patients who will be randomized one-to-one -to, -one to mervituximab plus carboplatin, followed by mervituximab continuation, versus carboplatin doublet of choice, uh, followed by maintenance of choice. Uh, and the idea here is, you know, when you talk to physicians about mervituximab, they, they want to be able to replace paclitaxel with our drug because patients don't lose our, their hair, um, we have less neuropathy, uh, and so this is uh, the first opportunity for us to really combine uh, MERV plus CARBO in a larger study uh, for, for Dr. Harder to do so and compare it directly to standard carboplatin doublets, which include carbopaclitaxel, carbodoxel, and carbogemcitabine. Uh, 
Uh, and so this study will help us get a better sense of the tolerability profile of the doublet, because at this point our database is a, you know, limited, but also the, the anti-tumor activity um, efficacy uh, in the recurrent platinum sensitive setting head to head uh, against available therapies. So this data set from Mirova will help guide further development of Mervatuximab plus carboplatin as a doublet. I should point out it's that it is one of three prongs that we are taking to understand the potential of mervatuximab plus carboplatin. The second prong is a neoadjuvant study, IST here in the U.S., uh, led uh, out of Ohio State. Uh, and that study is in the neoadjuvant setting, the first time we can get mervatuximab in untreated patients up front with uh, tumor tissue available at the time of their debulking study. Uh, surgery. And then the third is trial 420 that you heard about earlier, which is mervatuximab plus carboplatin in a broader population of FR alpha positive tumors. So between those three, among those three data sets, we will then have sufficient data uh, to support uh, the registration path for the mervatuximab plus carboplatin uh, doublet. Got it. Th thanks, Anna. Maybe, maybe just one um, follow-up. You, you've mentioned that, um, that there's certainly some evidence and, and some publications out there uh, to support the fact that patients with um, folate receptor positive disease or folate receptor high positive disease um, potentially have worse outcomes. Um, is, is there any other data that um, the, the team is, is working on or, or that, uh, that might become available uh, that, that can be used to sort of further um, support that that fact or, or be added to the um, uh, to the Soraya accelerated approval submission, or if not, what um, what data set do you see as the most supportive for that? Thank you. So we do not need any data regarding FR alpha as a prognostic factor to support our Soraya study and our path toward accelerated approval. We know that FR alpha is predictive of benefit from mervatuximab. We have a biomarker identified population in Soraya, FR alpha high patients, who clearly benefit from mervatuximab with a near tripling of the response rate, clinically meaningful duration of response, uh, and, and very nice tolerability. And so um, FR alpha is clearly predictive of benefit from mervatuximab. Um, the one data set that we can point to now that is more robust in terms of answering this prognostic question, um, the one data set that we can point to really is the forward one data set uh, where we did the post hoc analysis looking at MERV versus chemotherapy. Because again, you need this control arm, right, because that's where you're assessing how patients do with available therapies, where we inadvertently enrolled the low, medium, and high patients. And you can see with the higher the FR alpha expression, the worse patients do with investigator choice chemotherapy, be it response rate um, or, or progression-free survival. And I think, frankly, that's, that's the only data set that we're going to have for a while, Kenan, because now that we know, um, we're focused on the FR alpha high patients, approximately you know, 40 percent of all of the ovarian cancer patients who benefit the most from mervatuximab. I mean, down the road, maybe with mervatuximab plus carboplatin when we demonstrate very nice activity across a broader spectrum of uh, FR alpha patients uh, and we do a randomized trial there, maybe then we'll have a, a mix of patients where we can uh, circle back on this question of it being a prognostic factor. But really, from a development perspective uh, and from, for physicians to understand who benefits the best from mervatuximab, it's FR alpha high patients and that's what matters the most. Got it. Thanks again, and looking forward to seeing you at SGO. Thanks. Our next question coming from the line of Jessica Fai with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I need one more specific one on SGO. Uh, should we expect to see a swim plot, a spider plot, a waterfall at SGO? And also, will we see a PFS Kaplan-Meier curve or just the median PFS number? Come to, Jess, come to SGO, Jess. Uh, we will have visualizations of the data for you to understand the data. Okay, great. And on the platinum-sensitive setting, can you talk about what you see as the bars either for approval or for further development 
for the phase three evaluating merbituximab plus BAV maintenance in the float receptor high platinum sensitive setting, as well as for that um, uh, Merv carbo combo uh, with merbituximab continuation in the kind of broader folic receptor alpha expressing population? Sure. So in terms of the bar, we have designed Gloriosa, the randomized phase three study, to support full approval. The primary endpoint is progression-free survival. It's about 440 patients, uh, and the hazard ratio we're uh, aiming for is uh, around 0.7. Uh, or that's what it's designed for. Uh, and so um, this study is designed in a robust manner to demonstrate superior efficacy for mervituximab plus bevacizumab versus bevacizumab alone. In terms of the bar for mervituximab plus carboplatin, uh, that doublet, uh, we would anticipate needing a randomized phase three study for that doublet. So again, we would need an adequately powered randomized phase three study with a control arm of uh, standard available platinum-based doublets. Uh, that, that should answer your question, Jess, because these are both ran these the strategies would be randomized uh, trials. I think where the bar uh, uh, is less clear, to be honest, um, and the unmet need is increasing, is in the later line platinum sensitive patients uh, that uh, we are uh, um, studying in the Piccolo study. That's uh, a population where I think the unmet need is increasing um, and the bar there is not clear. Uh, we've already generated a handful of data supporting the uh, going forward with the Piccolo study and we look forward with engaging FDA on what the bar would be in that setting to support approval uh, from a single arm trial uh, from, for an accelerated approval. Got it, thank you. And our next question coming from the line of Arthur Hay with H.C. Winbright. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, most of our questions have been answered. Uh, I just uh, wonder, could you guys give us more color on the advantage for the uh, capitalizing platform? And uh, if possible, um, could you guys give us more color on the uh, partnership with uh, Eli Lilly? Um, sure. I mean, we covered most of what we have to say publicly about this program. So, you know, our chemists were looking for um, an additional payload. Uh, we noted the success uh, that, that Daiichi was uh, enjoying with, uh, with their camp to thesis. And so the question was, as a medicinal chemistry exercise, could we design uh, you know, a, you know, a, a better topo, uh, one inhibitor that, um, of the campesian class, uh, that, you know, would expand the therapeutic index, uh, for the, for the payload, either by better tolerability, better efficacy, or both. Um, what we think we have is, is a molecule with at least equivalent e efficacy with, um, um, with, um, uh, better tolerability and, and we think potentially um, better bystander uh, killing with this uh, with this molecule. So you know that's been the that's that's the basis. And then um, I can't really comment um, on the financials of the deal beyond uh, what's included in the in the press release that we issued uh, last week or the week before. Uh, thank you for thank you for the addition of color and uh, congrats on the progress this quarter. Thank you. Our next question coming from the line of Zoe so Kanzazar with Piper Sandler. Yelan is open. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks so much for, for taking my question here. Maybe one uh, just quick one from me. If I think back to forward one, I think it took about 10 months or so from enrollment completion to read out. So just wondering why there will be a shorter window for, for Mirasol. I know may, it's not maybe – apples to apples, but maybe you could help us better understand that dynamic, whether it be enrollment kinetics, event rate, or other things, and if there's risk that the readout could be pushed beyond 3Q. Thanks. You're spot on. Enrollment kinetics influence uh, uh, the timing of the readout. So progression-free survival is the primary endpoint. It's an event-driven uh, study, right? 
So uh, we will trigger the analysis for the primary endpoint when we reach the requisite number of events. Uh, and that is a function of both the enrollment uh, as well as the timing of the events. Um, the event rate in Mirasol is and should be similar to the event rate in Forward 1, uh, given that we're enrolling very similar populations. Um, the the uh, enrollment rate in Mirasol has been different from Forward 1. With Forward 1, uh, we had a very, very brisk enrollment the last three months, like it just shot up like crazy. Um, so a whole bunch of patients were enrolled right at the very end. So we had to wait a good long time to get to the requisite number of progression-free survival events. Here, um, with Mirasol being a, a larger study, um, and with the pandemic, uh, you know, the, the, we don't anticipate that super duper sharp tail in enrollment, like the, the curve right up. Um, and so that accounts for the differences in the timing. And so we're on track for uh, top line data in Q3. Okay, got it. That, uh, that's really helpful. Thanks for taking my question. Sure. Our next question coming from the line of Jonathan Chang with SVB Learing. Kilan is open. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. A couple non-MERV questions for me. Uh, first question, can you provide any color on your revenue guidance of 75 to $85 million? Uh, You noted that this doesn't include potential product sales from Mervituximab. Uh, so if you could provide any color as to what's reflected in this guidance, uh, that'd be helpful. And then the second question is, uh, can you provide any additional color on how the IMGC936 dose escalation is going and any additional granularity on when uh, initial data could be disclosed this year? Thank you. Great. Susan? Yep. So on the revenue guidance, uh, we include our non-cash royalty revenues um, and uh, the license and milestone fees to, to inclusive of the 75 to 85 million. So we don't include the Merck product revenues because we don't have a producer date yet, of course. And so um, they're just the timing of potential revenues um, would make be a, a factor in that. Um, so that, that's, that's what's inclusive in the revenue guidance. And turning to IMGC 936, uh, we are in dose escalation for this novel ADC with a novel uh, ADAM9 directed uh, antibody and the first uh, DM21 linker payload. So we are in dose escalation and we look forward to presenting data later this year once we've identified the recommended phase two dose and schedule uh, and uh, then uh, we'll be able to also share plans for further development in uh, ADAM9 positive tumors. Got it. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for our Q&A session. I would now like to turn the call back over to Mr. Mark Ennedy for any closing remarks. Great. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, we're excited about the year ahead. We have a number of important events upcoming, uh, starting with uh, SGO in a couple of weeks, and we look forward to uh, talking to all of you uh, then. So thanks very much, and we'll keep you updated on our progress. Ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't our conference for today. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.